Anjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shanyavadi Paschacha Dejatarine Vanchakaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we're continuing with the Bhakti Shastri study of the Sri Ishopanishad. And this evening we're going to look at mantra number nine. But before we go on to mantra number nine, Let's just review some of the topics which we've been covering in earlier slokas, right? Uh, we were speaking, for example, uh, about oneness, about the oneness with the Lord. Who remembers what's the term in Sanskrit? Ekadvam, oneness, right. So, how does the oneness differ between the Vaishnava philosophy, our understanding, and that of the Mayavadis, when they speak of oneness? What's the difference? For, for you, this is Vaishnavas, there is a oneness of all living entities, and also uh, we are the spark and parcel of uh, the Lord. So qualitatively we are the uh, same in plot, but not quantitatively, but there is oneness among all the living entities. That is what Ekatma means according to Vaishnava. According to uh, impersonalist, uh, this, this is about Brahman. They talk about Brahman realization and everything is Brahman for them. So there is oneness, the self within uh, every individual is the same with every other person. That's what they say. And finally, there's a realization of the self, they get uh, merged with the Lord. That's what they say. That is the oneness they are talking about. So, the, their oneness, they, as you said, they simply see everybody the same. Like, I am you, you are me. Yeah, that is, uh, that is among the uh, impersonalists. But even the Vaishnavas, and the, we, are the, we are qualitatively same, same as Krishna. That's what Vaishnavas teach. Of course, the living entities, uh, we are, we are, uh, Uttama Adhikari, who sees everybody as one from that perspective. Mm -hmm. So, what particular, I, I, I wanted the particular term, one word, which brings out the difference between the Mayavadi and the Vaishnava, that when they speak about oneness, that Vaishnava... Yeah. I'm thinking more, I, the word I'm thinking of is individuality. Right? Individuality. So, how is, what is the individuality for the Mayavadis? Mayavati don't propose to see individuality. They don't believe in individuality. What do they believe? They say it's all one and the same. We are one with God. What, what, what is that one? God. That is, that is what? They, they, they won't speak about God, they'll speak about what? 
Brahman. Yes. That's right. Brahman. They talk about Brahman. The Brahman, right? They speak about the Brahman. This is Sarvam Kauvidam Brahma. The Sarva uh, Sank Shankaracharya gave emphasis on that aphorism in the Vedas. Sarvam Kauvidam Brahma. Everything is Brahman. So there, Krishna is Brahman and we are Brahman. And there's no sense of individuality anymore. Right? So how do we defeat that? What would you quote? Can you give me a verse from Bhagavad Gita? We, as an individual soul, even after we will reach liberation, attain liberation, we will continue to be individual soul. So, what's the verse from Bhagavad Gita? Do you know any sloka from Bhagavad Gita which supports this? Yeah, in, I think it's 1842 or something. I'm not really sure of the shloka, but in 18th chapter it is spoken. What is spoken there? And also also in the 13th chapter, but I'm not able to remember the shloka. Somebody else can tell us what's a good shloka to support our individuality. Hare Krishna, Dandasana Maharaj. This sloka says, uh, I am the Amsi, you are all the Amsa, you are suffering in the material world uh, with uh, uh, six of, um, you know, um, uh, Indriyas like that. Okay. Yes, Mami Vamsa, the, the living entities are eternally my parts and parcels, that's one. There's another one. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaji. Thank you, Maharaji. Yes, that's the one I was thinking of. Yes. You know the translation? Yes, Maharaj. There was no time uh, where I did not exist or nor you, nor all these things, nor in future shall any one of the cease to be. Yes, thank you. Right, that's what I think generally when we speak about individuality, from the very beginning Krishna had brought this individuality up to Arjun, that we're all eternally individuals. We don't lose our individuality in the past, now or in the future. We've all, we're always, we're eternally individuals. So, so for, for the Mayavadis, they're speaking about giving up losing our individuality, this sayujya mukti, this impersonal liberation, this merging into the oneness. So this was their idea of oneness. Then we, we, yet this, this, mor this morning, earlier today, we spoke about Lord Krishna's qualities, how he is unembodied in the sense that someone can say, how is he unembodied? He does not have any veins like our uh, material body. His body is transcendental. Okay. What's this body made of? Sachitananda Vigraha Rupa. Yes, right. Both. Okay. He has, but he, ha he has a body, right? But not a body like our body. And then we spoke more about the Lord's character, how he is. Uh, pure and uncontaminated. Do you remember the words in Sanskrit? Someone? What? Shuddham. Yes? Shuddham. Shuddham meaning? Shuddham meaning antiseptic, right? Or pure. Yes, ma'am. And the other word? Apapibudham. Apapa vidam, meaning? Meaning? Prophylactic. Prophylactic. Yes, prophylactic. Can you explain to us mean the meaning? What's this prophylactic? Apapa 
prophylactic means uh, it is more like uh, preventive. Power of the association. Power of association. Uh, to just hear somebody say power of association, I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to understand by this. You have to. You have to give me some information to understand what you're talking about. Like uh, by, by, take, uh, by taking that, actually, like when you gave the example of malaria, like if we have malaria, then we need to take some prophylactic uh, uh, course. So uh, by associating or by taking that course, we will be saved with that. So similarly, in bhakti also, this acts as a prophylactic. So if we are uh, in association with the Lord or with the devotees, then we are saved. So uh, we can do any nonsense we like and Krishna will protect us, right? No, uh, Maharaj. So what do you mean? It purifies us. It purifies us. Purifies, huh? Prevent, prevent, it prevents um, not get protect. Uncontaminate. Prabhupada quoted the verse about even if one is the most sinful person, but still if he's situated in transcendental knowledge, he quickly becomes righteous, right? Suduracha. So, so, so that even the one has bad habits, he's sinful, he does something sinful, but he, somehow he's a devotee of Krishna. And so he, he hates himself for doing these things, he regrets it. And Krishna quickly cracks his mentality. So Prabhupada often spoke about how Lord Krishna uh, people like to imitate Lord Krishna because, you know, we sing about Lord Krishna, Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari, all glories to Radha and Krishna's pastimes in the forests of Vrindavan. And people think, oh, you know, oh, it's very nice, you know, I also want to be like Krishna, I also want to dance Rasa Leela, right? But, can we do it? What does Prabhupada say? You want to be Gopijana Balaba, then for, you also have to be what is it? Uh, yes, you have to be Giri Baridari. Right? Yeah. You want to be Gopijana Balaba, then also be Giri Baridari. Pick up the Govardhan Hill. Then you qualify. So People may argue to us, they may say, oh, this Krishna, he's just some lusty cowherd boy. He has some pastime, he has affairs with all these young girls in the forest, in Vrindavan in the night. So, how, what will you say about these things when people talk to you like that? Can you defend the honour of Krishna? Someone? I've heard all about Lord Krishna, this Krishna of yours, that he goes in the forest, he does all these things with the young girls. He's just some lusty man. What are you going to say? Like marriage? Yes? should not uh, consider Lord as a mundane uh, activities, whatever he does. And he also did many things when he was born, he born with four hands and then he killed uh, many demons when he was infant. So, if you are able to do all these… So, if I'm able to what? If, if you are not able to do all these kind of activities, you know, you cannot… Uh, you're supposed to do that also. Imitate, you cannot imitate the Lord. Okay, but why, why does he do these things? Like, go with the… why, why, why is he doing this? This activity… He's doing to protect the devotees. Huh? Doing to protect the devotees. For the pleasure of the devotees. Yeah. Also, 
which we have to explain, you see that Lord Krishna performs these activities, he, it's in, they, they do it in their spiritual bodies. These gopis are not ordinary ladies. Just as Lord Krishna is not an ordinary man, these gopis of Vrindavan were not ordinary ladies. They were all expansions of Srimati Radharani. And Srimati Radharani is the Ladini Shakti of Lord Krishna. She's the pleasure potency of Lord Krishna. And she expands herself in the form of these different gopis, the cowherd girls of Vrindavan. And their whole purpose is to give pleasure to Lord Krishna. And they come to this world to show us the pastimes of the spiritual world. They're coming here not for just for their pleasure, but they're coming to show us how to give pleasure to Krishna. And they're showing us the activities of the spiritual world. The activities of the material world are perverted reflections of what goes on in the spiritual world. So people look at the activities of Lord Krishna, particularly his pastimes with the gopis, and they think they are material. They do not understand that they are not material, that they are transcendental, and they are performed in their spiritual bodies. They have nothing to do with the modes of nature. In the material world, everything is centered around the body, and the body means the senses, and senses mean desire, desire for lust, desire for material enjoyment. But in the spiritual world, there's no lust. There's none of the, this uh, thought of sense gratification, one person exploiting another. Everyone in the spiritual world is a pure-hearted soul and they have a spiritual body, and they're engaged in activities simply for pleasing Krishna. So these activities which Krishna performed 5,000 years ago, these were from the spiritual world. Lord Krishna personally appeared along with his devotees, and they, they showed us the activities of the spiritual world. And they did this, to attract all of us that we would want to go back there and join with him and join in with them, take part in their activities. What are you saying? Is that a comment? No marriage by mistake. Okay. I thought you had something to say. All right. So, we have to be able to defend the honour of Lord Krishna and to explain to people that there's no lust, there's no sex, none of the sex going on in the spiritual world. This is all the perverted forms which go on in the material world. In the spiritual world there is pure love, and love means to Krishna. Everyone loves Krishna. So the activities which took place 5,000 years ago with Lord Krishna were showing us how these great gopis, these ladies, who I say are not ordinary ladies, have spiritual bodies and how they're fully devoted to Krishna. Any question? Any argument? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, just wanted to like in case like uh, marriage you told that the gopis have the spiritual bodies like not ordinary body so which reference we can quote if like we tell like these gopis have a spiritual body can we quote some references maharaj where we can tell them yeah this is they were not on the ordinary plane they were on the spiritual plane and these activities are not on perform on material uh, like is it uh, can we quote some references on this because the immediate argument like based on what we are putting this. Uh-huh. Alright. So, 
you can read, for example, there, there are five chapters concerning the, the activities of Lord Krishna and the gopis in the 10th canto Srimad Bhagavatam. Yeah. So you, get, you can get some information there. Okay. And you can also read in the, uh, the chapter number, in the 11th canto, I think it's chapter 31, you read about the disappearance of Lord Krishna. And you can read there, you can read about how Lord Krishna, how he disappears from the world and how his body is not material and how he, per how he performs a trick in leaving the world, just like a magician does magic. Krishna left a body to bewilder the atheists, the innocent, the, the foolish people who thought he had an ordinary body. Krishna left a body there, a material body. It was like a maya Krishna, not his own body, but in his spiritual body he disappeared. And the same happened for all of Krishna's devotees, because when Krishna comes, he doesn't come alone, but he comes with all of his devotees. And they also came and they performed their pastime. So in that chapter, it talks that you can read different references. There's a very good section at the end of the chapter with many scriptural references describing about how the body of the Lord and his associates are not material. That's the 11th, can, 11th canto, chapter 31st Yeah, Disappearance of Lord Krishna. It's the last chapter. Okay? Yeah. Thank you, so we'll go ahead now. Mantra number nine, Sri Ishopanishad. Andanta Maha Pravishanti. Andanta Pravishanti. Yevidyam Pasate. Yevidyam Pasate. Tatobu Yaivate Tamo. Yao vidya yam rataha. Translation. Those who engage in the culture of nascent activities shall enter into the darkest region of ignorance. Worse still are those in the, engaged in the culture of so-called knowledge. All right. So we're going on to a, a section now, the next uh, section here in the Ishopanishad, where Krishna is going to talk about, first of all, culturing knowledge and nations, and then he will speak about different kinds of worship, in other words, different levels of devotees, how they, have, they engage in different kinds of activities and what happens to them. All right, so we're going to hear the, those engaged in the culture of nascent activities. Nascent activities meaning activities all in relation to ignorance, the body, and sense gratification. So they enter into the darkest region of ignorance. But even worse are those engaged in the culture of so-called knowledge. So this so-called knowledge is more dangerous than even just gross sense gratification. All right, we'll go ahead. Who would like to read for us? Someone? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Okay, per then go ahead, read. Purport. This mantra offers a comparative study of vidya and avidya. Avidya or ignorance is undoubtedly dangerous, but vidya or knowledge is even more dangerous, which when mistaken or misguided. This mantra of Sri Isopanishad is more applicable today than at any time in the past. Modern civilization has advanced considerably in the field of mass education, but the result, but the result is that people are more unhappy than ever before because of the stress placed on the material advancement to the exclusion of the most important part of life the spiritual aspect. Would you like to comment on this for us? Please tell us, you know, the Prabhupada said it is more applicable not today than at any time in the past. 
Would you agree with this? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Maybe you could we tell all... in relation to life in Bahrain. believe that we are all well educated, uh, we are all trained to uh, lead the life for which we have been uh, created in this world, but actually it is not. We have been um, not trained or we have not been practicing anything of our spiritual aspect for quite some time uh, before actually we are even uh, joining in this kind of spiritual movement. Correct. Would you agree that people are more unhappy than before? Indeed. We, we are deluded by the, the, taken away by this advancement of industrialization and education and things like that. We are just floating on uh, thinking that this is the happiness, this is what we need to progress on without realizing the real purpose of our life. So in some ways this lockdown which we have been experiencing with the pandemic situation is, is a good thing for the world. Do you agree? Indeed, for us it is. For you it is, yeah? You're getting more happiness now than you were before? I have got more time to read, I have got more time to associate with devotees during this time than ever before. Okay. So Prabhupada talks, advancing in the field of mass education, yeah, so more and more people going to colleges and universities, you know, so many people now have PhDs and they've studied more, but <laughs> that doesn't mean that their, their lives are more successful or, or happier. People spend so much money for their education, but they they neglect, of course, they, they often they have no interest, the spiritual aspect of life. Okay, so we're going to hear more about this culture of Vidya and Avidya. Huh? Someone else like to read the next paragraph? As far as Vidya is concerned, the first mantra has explained very clearly that the Supreme Lord is the proprietor of everything and that forgetfulness of this fact is ignorance. The more a man forgets that this fact of life, the more he is into darkness. In view of this, a godless civilization directed towards the so-called advancement of education is more dangerous than a civilization in which the masses of people are less educated. So, what is this first mantra Prabhupada is talking about, where Krishna, the Lord is the proprietor of everything? Can you quote this for me? Yeah. Um, the, the first mantra is Isha Vasyam Idam Sarvam Yat Nchit Jagatyam Jagat Yena Tektena Bhunjita Ma Karsit I am missing the last line, Maharaj, sorry. Ma. Yes? Ma? Someone can Ma. help him? Ma Vidha Tasya Svit Anam. Okay. Ma Vidha Tasya Svit Anam. Sorry, Maharaj. Okay. So, this is a very important verse. Prabhupada is referring to it here. The Lord is the proprietor. And if we forget this, this is ignorance. So, no, no, yes, right. Uh, but the more we forget, then the more we're in darkness. So, godless civilization means advancement of education. A godless civilization directed towards advancement of education is more dangerous. Why is it more dangerous? Uh, because uh, it, it does not have the, uh, it, it does not touch upon the uh, godly, godly uh, the God aspect, the Isha Vasya. So, 
whatever we do would uh, bind us into karma and uh, we would be again taking uh, birth and again and again in this material world. Oh, well, that's individuals own problem. I want to know how the, the godless civilization is more dangerous than a civilization. Talking about civilization. Someone can say, why is a godless civilization more dangerous? Where, where the people... They might be not in uh, the good human beings. They are not making good human beings in, for the society. They could be harmful. So what are they doing? So, what, in what way are they harm? What way are they going to be harmful? Demonic uh, mentality would develop. So what is the what is that demonic mentality? What do they do? I am I am the uh, enjoyer. I am the oh, writer kind of. Yes. Can you give Designer. some Can you give yeah. some examples? of the godless civilization which come about, so-called advancement of education have brought about some examples of the godless civilization? The scientific, uh, the scientist actually which they, uh, which they boast upon their uh, uh, theories like Darwin theory and all those. Okay, so, yeah, atheistic theories like Darwin. Mm -hmm. And what's he preaching? Uh, the evolution theory which he is preaches, you know, that everything evolves on its own. Oh. Which is, which is again not, in, uh, not giving the godly, uh, God into picture. You know, it says everything evolves on its own. So okay. A any other examples about godless civilization with the advancement of education? What have they brought about? In Bhagavad Gita, this is discussed, chapter 16, Divine and Demonic Nature. What did Prabhupada talk about in his purport? You don't remember. You haven't studied Bhagavad Gita very well. The demonic civilization, they do things, they create atom bombs. Right? Anything else? Can you think of anything else? The so-called advanced educated society, how it's so godless, so dangerous. What else have they done? Oh, mercy, big slaughterhouses, Maharaj. Yes, big slaughterhouses. Mechanized slaughterhouses for killing cows. The pollution. Okay, something else? So life has become more lusty. Yes. In what ways? What are people doing? Marriage, go, trying to go to another planet. Okay, trying to go to another planet. They want to enjoy on the other planet. There's so many examples how the so-called advanced society, they have things like abortions, you know, different ways of preventing women from giving birth to children, but at the same time they want to have sex, but they don't want children. This is the demonic civilization. These kind of things are going on. And then you have cloning, genetically modified crops, they're trying to take more from the land, not by their piety, but they want to, they're thinking with their technology, techni technological modified crops, genetically modified crops, killing the people, killing the farming industry, and, and then they do the same thing with the cows, drain the last bit of milk out of the cow by some machine, and when the cow doesn't give milk anymore, then they kill it. This is a so-called advanced civilization. Okay, we'll go ahead. 
Someone, Maharaj, pl- yes. One more thing I want to add. Yeah. Like, uh, like in America and European countries, the cows are paid with the cow blood. So that is like blood meal are provided to them, and all whole world is forced to eat that particular non-vegetarian milk and products. And it is also with all advertisement that it is a trade, which is spoiling all the food habits of all the people. Also. Okay. Yeah. Horrible. All right, go ahead, somebody. Next paragraph. Hare Krishna. Tribunga Gopal Das here. Yes, Prabhu. Of the different classes of men and karmis, jnanis and yogis, the karmis are those who are living in the activities of sense gratitude. In the modern civilization, 99.9% of the people are engaged in the activities of sense gratification under the flags of industrialism, economic development, altruism, political activism, and so on. All these activities are more or less based on satisfaction of the senses to the exclusion of the kind of God consciousness described in the first mantra. So what is that God consciousness described in the first mantra? Can you tell us? In the first mantra, the uh, human being to live their life entering the God, Lord Krishna. But here they are keeping their sense gratification in their center, Bhagat Krishna. But in the first mantra, what should happen? We should have Krishna in the center. And what else? Everything animated, uh, uh, animate and inanimate in that within the universe controlled only by Lord. One should therefore accept only those things necessary for himself. Right. This is the point. Oh, except on, only what we need, the, you know, we minimize, right? We, we don't yeah. want to be extravagant, we don't want to be greedy, we want to be satisfied with the basic needs. We don't want too much, right? That's important. Go ahead. Someone else read? Chandra Pranam Maharaj, Ajit Madhusudan Das. In the language of the Bhagavad Gita 7.15, people who are engaged in gross sense gratification are mudas, asses. The ass is symbol of stupidity. Those who simply engage in the profitless pursuit of sense gratification are worshipping avidya, according to Isopanishad. And those who play the role of helping this sort of civilization in the name of educational awareness are actually doing more harm than those who are on the platform of cross sense gratification. The advancement of learning by a godless people is a dangerous as a valuable jewel on the hood of a cobra. Cobra decorated with a valuable jewel is more dangerous than one not decorated. In Hari Bhakti Subodaya 3.11.12, the advancement of education by a godless people is compared to decoration on a dead body. In India, as in many other countries, some people follow the custom of leading a procession with a decorated dead body for the pleasure of the lamenting relative. In the same way, modern civilization is patchwork of activities meant to cover the perpetual miseries of material existence. All such activities are aimed towards sense gratification. But above the senses is the mind, and above the mind is the intelligence, and above the intelligence is the soul. Thus the aim of real education should be self-realization. Realization of the spiritual values of the soul. Any education which does not lead to such realization must be considered a vidya or non uh, nascence. And to culture such nascence means to go down to the darkest region of ignorance. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah, one of the devotees was talking, he said, uh, devotees all go to study 
They, they want to do postgraduate studies, they want to do masters. He said, why they want to do master? They should learn to be the servant. More important to be the servant than to be the master. So they, and then they want to do master's degree, they want to get MA. MA means master of avidya, right? Master of avidya, nations. What is that? It's useless, useless education. So Srila Prabhupada's talking, he gives two examples here, right? Did you, direct, did you pick out the two examples about how modern education is more dangerous than, the, than just being uneducated? What were the examples? Like one example is given the jewel on the hood of the cobra. The person who is uh, considered to be educated now, he feels he is like a, putting a jewel on his head and he moves around the world that I am the person with a PhD and doctorate and uh, I know everything. But he does not know anything on the science of self realization Can you tell me why the, why this, the, the cobra with the jewel on the head is more dangerous than the cobra without the jewel? No, because if a person does not have those uh, big fancy degrees, the person, he considers himself to be a low profile and he will be propagating whatever small thing he knows by himself. But person who has wrong, learned the wrong theories, he will be propagating wrong theories all around the world and people considering him as a big man will try to follow him and they will all fall into trap. That is like all the wrong gurus, those who are… Uh, so I'm asking you, just, just answer the question. Answer the question I asked you. Why is the snake with the jewel more attractive than the snake without the jewel? Why is it more dangerous? I mean, why is it more… There is a jewel, there is a jewel on his head. So people will be attracted towards the jewel. Right. Of course, this is the point. That people are more attracted by the jewel. Okay. So people think they have a you know, so somebody thinks he has a jewel said, you know, somebody thinks he's educated, it's like the jewel on the head, all right? So the snake with the jewel, is, if it's just a snake, okay, it's a snake, you know, just leave it, get rid of it or something. But when the snake has a jewel on his head, that, oh, I want to see the jewel, maybe we can get the jewel and, you know, it becomes more attractive, so then it becomes dangerous to play with the snake. So that's the example. And then the other example, second example, Maharaji. A Maharaji can tell us. Let's hear from the ladies. The second example. Maharajis? What's it? Yes, what's the other example? Yeah, uh, if uh, leading a procession with a decorated dead body for the pleasure of the lamenting relief. Yeah. Why is this com compared to uh, education? What's this got to do with the example? To show off actually. The point is that the person's dead. What's the point in decorating him? There's no purpose to decorating the person when he's on the dead body. You know, it's like somebody dies. You want to paint their face, you want to put their makeup on before they put the body in the cremation, before they put the body in the, mor in the crematorium. Are you going to paint the face? Make him look, you want to look good? No, the body's dead. So like that, decorating a dead body is useless. So the same with this a kind of education which people are undergoing is also just useless because they're simply becoming more attached to the body. They're becoming more attached to the body. They're, they're not, they haven't understood the real goal of life. They haven't identified the soul. So they've wasted their education. So this is nations. 
All right, we'll go ahead. Let's have a Mariji read. Please, quickly. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. Yeah. According to the Bhagavad Gita 2.4 to 7.50, mistaken mundane educators are known as Veda, Veda Vyada Rata and Mayaya Aparita Jnana. They may also be atheistic demons, the lowest of men. Those who are Veda Vada Rata pose themselves as very learned in the Vedic literature. But unfortunately, they are completely diverted from the purpose of the Vedas. In the Bhagavad Gita 15.15, it is said that the purpose of the Vedas is to know the personality of Godhead. But these Veda, Veda Vada Rata men are not at all interested in the personality of Godhead. On the contrary, they are fascinated by such formative results as the attainment of heaven. Okay, so now we're going to hear about these kind of mistaken mundane educators. All right. So what are they cultivating? Vidya or avidya? Much avidya? Yes, they're cultivating avidya, right? Even though they, they may be doing it in the name of religion, but still they're cultivating avidya. So Prabhupada says that they may be, they may also be atheistic demons, the lowest of men, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes four kind of people who never surrender to him. Do you remember? No, Maharaj. No? Somebody can help her? Who remembers four kinds of people who don't surrender to Krishna? Mudas, Nara, Adama, Maya, Bhagavata, Jnana and Asuram Bhava. Right, right. So the Asuram Bhava Mashrita, right? There's a maya aparita jnana, meaning one whose knowledge is stolen by illusion, and the asuram bhava mashita, the atheistic demons. So they are the lowest of men. And here Prabhupada is talking about the Veda Vada Rata. Some, in some places Prabhupada describes the Veda Vada Rata as those people who simply mouth the words of the Vedas. They may speak the words of the Vedas. But what's wrong? Anything wrong with that? Don't, they don't believe on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yeah, they may not believe in the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They they don't they don't actually bodily. know. Yeah? Someone? Yeah? Bodily concept of life. Yeah, they don't know the purpose behind the Vedas. Yeah, purpose. Right? They have not understood the purpose of the Vedas. What is the purpose of the Vedas? Uh, uh, to know Krishna, like Vedas just uh, Hameva Vedya. Yes, 1515, 15, right? Yes, Krishna says, I am the author and I am the compiler of the Vedas. By all the Vedas I am to be known. So the whole purpose of the Vedas is meant to know Krishna. But these people, they what do they think the purpose of the Vedas is? Heaven. Going to heaven. Yeah, they're thinking about going to heaven. That's what Prabhupada says. They think the purpose of the Vedas is to go to heaven. They're not interested in Krishna. <laughs> they're thinking of going to heaven. Why do they want to go to heaven? Sense yeah, there's a lot of lot more sense enjoyment there. Long life, less misery, you don't need to go to factory, you don't have to go to office. Eh? You know, there's a lot of enjoyment there. Long life. Beautiful people, attractive, everybody and they live a long time. <laughs> So like this, people are thinking, this is the purpose of the Vedas. And in the Vedas, it may also speak about these things also. There are sections in the Vedas which glorify this. But you have to understand the purpose of the Vedas. And you cannot understand the purpose of the Vedas 
just by your own efforts. How do we? How should we understand the purpose of the Vedas? Through an acharya of disciplic succession. Yes, right. You have to get association. You have to get the acharya, the teacher, to guide you to understand what's behind the Vedas. Just like people read, may read the Vedas, but very difficult to know what is the purpose of the Vedas. That's why the, that's why the Puranas are there, right? The Vedas are the Shruti, but to understand the Shruti is very difficult. You have to get the Smriti, the Puranas, like, like they're there to help us to understand what is really the meaning behind the Shruti. Because otherwise the Vedas is very difficult to understand. We'll get lost. All right. We'll go ahead. Another Maharaji can read. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. As stated, as stated in Mantra 1, we should note that the Personality of Godhead is the proprietor of everything and that we must be satisfied with all, with our allotted portions of the necessities of life. The purpose of all Vedic literature is to awaken this God consciousness in the forgetful living being and this same purpose is presented in various ways in the different scriptures of the world for the understanding of a foolish mankind. Thus, the ultimate purpose of all religions is to bring one back to Godhead. Okay. So, Mantra 1, do you remember Mantra 1? Mariji, do you remember Mantra 1? You can say it for us. Everything is controlled by uh, Supreme Lord Krishna and everything is owned by the Lord. Therefore, what's the second half of the verse? Uh, means uh, that Kota Maharaj, we, we should accept what is ours. Yes, Prabhupada writes, you just read it. He said, we must be satisfied with our allotted portion of the necessities of life. Our allotted portion, we should have to be satisfied with what Krishna gives us. We shouldn't be greedy, I need more, I need more, I need this, I need that. You know, we have to be, learn to be satisfied with the plan of the Lord. And, and Prabhupada talks about this, that, that the Veda is, is meant to awaken this kind of God consciousness. When we become God conscious, then we will be naturally satisfied with what's given by the grace of God. So Prabhupada said that this, this should be the common understanding of all different scriptures. You know, people study the Vedas and they're thinking how to get this, how to get that, how to get the beautiful wife, how to get money, how to get fame. Yeah, they're all thinking, Ishwaraham Mahambhogi, right? I'm the controller, I'm the enjoyer, I'm strong, I'm happy, I'm perfect, like this. So this is foolishness. We have to understand what is our position that we are tiny souls, insignificant servants of the Supreme Lord. So, this is the, mean, the purpose of all religions is to bring one back to Godhead. We want to get out of this material world, we want to come to God consciousness. This is the real mission of life. Sometimes they say, we want the kingdom of God without God. <laughs> How is it possible, Prabhupada says, you want the kingdom of God but you don't want God? <laughs> That's ridiculous. But this is how people think. Okay, go ahead. Another person read. Another Maharaji, one more. Thank you, 
Krishna marriage, but the Veda Vada Ratha people, instead of realizing that the purpose of the Vedas is to revive the forgetful soul's lost relationship with the personality of Godhead, take it for granted that such side issues as the attainment of heavenly pleasure for sense gratification. The lust for which causes their material bondage in the first place are the ultimate end of the Vedas. Such people misguide others by inter, inter, <coughs> misinterpreting the Vedic literature. Sometimes when they condemn the Puranas, which are authentic Vedic explanations for layman, laymen, the Veda Vada Rathas give their own explanations of the Vedas, neglecting the authority of great teachers, Acharyas. They also tend to raise some unscrupulous persons from the, among themselves and present him as the leading exponent of Vedic knowledge. Such Veda Vada Rattas are especially condemned in this mantra by the very appropriate Sanskrit words Vidhyayam Rataha. Vidhyayam refers to the study of the Vedas because the Vedas are the origin of all knowledge, Vidya. And Ratha means those engaged. Vidhyayam Rataha thus means those engaged in the study of Vedas. The so-called students of the Vedas are condemned here, herein because they are ignorant of the actual purpose of the Vedas on account of their disobeying the Acharyas. Such Vedavada Ratas search out meaning in every word of the Vedas to suit their own purposes. They do not know that the Vedic literature is a collection of extraordinary books that can be understood only through the chain of disciplic succession. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Prabhupada is describing to us some of the problems here, what we face with these people, Vedavada Ratas, yeah. They give their own explanation of the Vedas. You know, if you have to preach in academic circles, if you have to mix with these people, you get a lot of these uh, Vedavada Ratas. They're very familiar, very well versed in the Vedas, and they can quote scriptures. And then they're going to, they quote the Vedas. They've got all the slokas there about the goal of life, going to, to go to heaven and enjoy life. And, and you have many different societies. There's the Vedanta societies where people are all impressed with their knowledge. So they don't understand the real purpose, the ultimate end of the Vedas. But they condemn the Puranas, well, they say, because how they will condemn the Puranas, they say, this is, this is Smriti, these are books written, what will they say about the Puranas? How will they criticize them? They will say, these are books written by an ordinary man. They're imperfect. The Vedas, these are eternal. This is from the Lord. This is directly from the, the Lord Himself. This is not from Apurusha, right? The Vedic knowledge is Apurusha, not from any ordinary person. But your scriptures, your Puranas, no, no, they're just stories and things, you know. Just give them just mundane literature, they will say, it's not, your, your literatures are not uh, transcendent, they're not perfect. And so yeah, this is why Prabhupada translated the Ishopanishad. This is why Prabhupada gave us this sh evidence from the Shruti. Because when you, when you go and meet these academics and these philosophers, you meet people like Vedavada Ratas, and you have to argue with them on the basis of the Vedas. And they want to hear sh Shruti mantras. They want to hear evidence from the Shrutis. They won't accept the Puranas. They won't accept Bhagavad Gita. Although they should, but they don't. Okay, so therefore, and this is why people, Jiva Goswami, Bhakti Siddhanta, Sarasati, Madhvachari, they all gave evidence from the Shruti mantras to support the Vaishnava philosophy. So Vedavada Rata have their own people, they have their own acharyas. Oh, follow the acharya. Yes, we have our acharya. 
we have our acharyas, great teachers. So they they put forward their own people as being acharyas, and they think you follow him. So Prabhupada gives us these Sanskrit words, vidya, vidya yam rataha, vidya yam rataha. They study the Vedas, those engaged in the study of the Vedas. So we challenge them that they have not understood the actual purpose behind the Vedas. So they're, they're not actually following the, the real Acharyas. Who are the real Acharyas? Discipline section, Maharaj. Okay. Come from the discipline section. Yeah. And except. Anybody, anybody else? Knows the science of Krishna. So who knows the science of Krishna? Who are they? Acharyas. The Mahajans, right? You know the Mahajans? The Mahajans, they are the science and, and the, the, they know the science of Krishna devotional service. Right? How many Mahajans are there? Twenty. Okay. So follow the Mahajans. And then if you read in the purport in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Srila Prabhupada writes how we have modern day Mahajans. And he mentions people like Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, Baladev Vijabhusan, and uh, Jiva Goswami and Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, they are the modern day Acharyas, the modern day Mahajans. Follow them. So they've actually understood the purpose of the Vedas, and we can understand the purpose of the Vedas by hearing from them. All right, we'll go ahead. A man can read now. Let's have another man read. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, one must approach a bona fide spiritual master with sincerity. Hare Krishna So they fall further into than those who have no. If you don't have, you're better not to know anything about the Vedas than to know the wrong thing about the Vedas, right? Better you don't know anything. Better you just be totally ignorant than to know the wrong thing. One must approach a bona fide spiritual master. How will we recognize the bona fide spiritual master? What's his qualification? Give me a verse. One person? What do you say? Vedam, 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 that is from the Mupadisham. Okay. Someone else, another verse? So you must control the senses, right? Yeah, yeah. He is with the Parampara system. So can he get angry? Can he get angry or not? 
If he gets angry, if he gets angry, then he's not a guru, eh? Can the guru get angry? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. You don't mind if he gets angry at you, eh? If he shouts at you. For chastising the people for their own development. Okay. Taking away your false ego, right? Make you humble. Giving mercy if he chastises you, gets angry at you. He's giving you mercy. Yes, yes. Oh, so, some other qualification of the guru bona fide spiritual master. What's some other verse or other qualification? So what is the quali what is the qualification of the spiritual master? Tell me in English. The, like uh, the uh, he's a self realized soul and he can impart uh, the uh, knowledge on the absolute truth. Yes. That not only has he seen the truth, but he can reveal it to others. Right? He's seen, he's seen the truth himself and he can reveal it to others. Some people say, I know the truth, but I can't explain it to you. So, you know, so that's not so good. But the, the actual bona fide teacher, not only has he realized the truth himself, but he can reveal it to others. So that's one qualification. Something else? How does he become a spiritual master? By Acharan Maharaj, like, uh, he, he has to he has to dis, 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 by practicing, like you know, he himself will do the acharan first, and that is where he can impart the similar. Yeah, he, he must have heard from somebody else, right? Yes, the, yes. The, the, good, the good student will go on and become the teacher. So, the same way, Shrotriyam Brahmanishtam, Tadvigyanatam Saguru Meva Bhagachit. Like, like that, the, 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 the spiritual master, he must have heard from another spiritual master. All right, so he heard from somebody. It's not that, how, how did you become, oh, I realized everything on my own. I just realized everything on my own, by my own, and I've realized the conclusion, now I know everything, so I'm revealing it to you. No, that's bogus. It's just like... You get doctors, oh, I, I learned everything on my own, I've studied everything, you know, I didn't go to college, I didn't study from any, I just learned everything on my own. You know, that's bogus, that's a quack, quack doctor, not a genuine doctor, right? You have to study under another doctor. So same with spiritual teacher, he heard the teachings from another teacher, he was trained. You take the shell, you have to be initiated by a bona fide spiritual master. Prabhupada had his spiritual master. Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati also had his spiritual master. Lord Chaitanya also had a spiritual master. Lord Krishna even took a spiritual master. Just to teach us by their example the importance that you have to take a spiritual master. So you, one must approach a spiritual master to understand the message of the Vedas. We have to know who is the spiritual master. That they must have heard from somebody else and Shrotriyam Brahmanishtam. Brahmanishtam meaning what? One, uh, one who has uh, understood the truth from the bona fide spiritual master. Shrotriyam means authority. Who has uh, heard, heard it from the authority. Yes, yeah, so what does Brahmanishtam mean? Brahmanishtam is to, uh, he has heard about the Brahman, the absolute truth, from the uh, authority. 
Brahmanishtam. Fixed, right? He's fixed in the Brahman. Meaning, if one is fixed in the Brahman, then one is no longer attracted to Is fixed in the Brahman. So, what can we understand? He, uh, when, he, when we fix in the Brahman, he is on the he is a, he has uh, he has attained that realization by learning it from the authority. That means. No, no, you're not getting the point. He's fixed in the Brahman, meaning. He is not materially attached. He's not interested in sense gratification. Yes, ma'am. He's fixed in the Brahman. So he's not attracted by the illusory world, the temporary world, and the pleasures of the material world. Because he's taking place, he's in the, on the platform of Brahman. He's detached from the body, detached from the senses. So he's not, he's not concerned with the material aspects of life because he's on a higher platform, right? So this is actually required. If you see the spiritual master, if you see him, you know, very materialistic, you know, very uh, much enjoying mood, then it's not very good. There has to be some renunciation. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya glorified Lord Chaitanya, Vairagya Vijanija Bhakti Yoga, that Lord Chaitanya came to teach detachment, Vairagya, along with Vidya and Bhakti. So Jnana and Vairag, they follow wherever there is Bhakti. If there's genuine devotion, there will be also Jnana and Vairag. So this Brahma, this Brahmanishta means Vairag. Detachment from the material. So this is the qualification of the spiritual master. Then he can teach the message of the Vedas. Right? This is the direction of Mundaka Upanishad. Vedavadarata people, however, have their own acharya. They're not in the chain of transcendental concept. Thus they progress into the darkest region of ignorance by misinterpreting the Vedic literature. So how many how many lines of disciplic succession do we have? In the Vaish, in Vaishnavism, huh? For, right? Where are they coming from? One is from Brahma, one is from Shiva, one Lakshmi, and four Kumaras. So what are they called? Present day? How are they known? Ours is Brahma Madhva Dodiya Sampradaya. Okay. And next one is called as uh, Rudra Sampradaya. Who is that? Sri Anandras. Rudra Sampradaya Shiva, Lord Shiva. So Shankaracharya. Who, who is the. Huh? Shankaracharya. No, no. Who is the prominent Acharya in the Rudra Sampradaya? Not Shankaracharya. Shankaracharya. No. no. Nambarka Acharya is from the four Kumars. Nambarka Acharya is the four that's from the four Kumars. Right? Vishnu Swami. Vishnu Swami, yeah. Vishnu Swami is the, the prominent Acharya in the line from Lord Shiva. And then Lakshmi? Sri Sri Sampadaya. Yes. Prominent Acharya being? Ramanuja Acharya. right. So four Sampradayas. Lord Chaitanya took teachings from each of the Sampradayas into his own Sampradaya, into his own Brahma Madhva Godiya Vaishnav Sampradaya, Godiya Vaishnav. But he took the main teachings, the main points from the other Sampradayas and brought them in to synthesize, to bring the four Sampradayas into one. But these Vedavadarata, they have their own sampradaya. And Shankaracharya, he has his sampradaya, Mayavadi sampradaya. They have their sampradayas. 
We are the Vaishnav Sampradaya. We are teaching the living entities, the servant of the Lord. These other people, they don't teach that. Go ahead, please read. Mail, some mail, man, please read. Yes? Hare Krishna, the Hare Krishna. The Maya Parata Jnana class of men are self-made God. Such men think that they themselves are God and that there is no need of worship any other God. They will agree to worship an ordinary man if he happen to be rich, but they will never worship the personality of God. Such men, unable to recognize their own foolishness, never consider how it is that God can be uh, entrapped by Maya, his own illusory energy. If God were ever entrapped by Maya, Maya would be more powerful than God. Such men say that God is all-powerful, but they do not consider that if he is all-powerful, there is no possibility of his, his being overpowered by Maya. This self-made God cannot answer any of these questions very clearly. They are simply satisfied to have become God themselves. <laughs> they are simply satisfied to become God themselves. Right? So probably Maya, Aparita, Jnana are self-made gods. They make themselves God. Such men think themselves as are God and that there's no need of worshipping any other God, right? If I'm God, yeah, <laughs> no need to worship anybody else. So this is their, their thinking. They will agree to worship an ordinary man if he happens to be rich. <laughs> to see, this is the mentality of people in the material world. Somebody's very rich, oh, that people worship him. People are thinking, you know, this is, if somebody has a lot of money, then he has all the blessings of God, they're thinking. The rich man can be the most miserable man, can be the most unhappy man, because having wealth simply creates so many troubles, makes people, can make people's life miserable. We see sometimes the richest people in the world, they commit suicide, they're so unhappy. Their life is so miserable. But somehow people, they respect wealth. It's one of the opulences of Bhagavan. Somebody has wealth, it's a, like a blessing from the Lord. Or you could, sometimes you could say it's a curse also. It's up to them how they use the wealth. You have to know how to use it. That is the point. Nothing wrong in being rich if you know how to use it. So these people, they worship people if they're very rich, but they will never worship the real God. Don't like to worship the deity. They say, oh, de just a statue. They'll never consider how it is that God can be entrapped by Maya. So this, this is an important point because uh, their argument is that we're all God, right? This is their philosophy that ultimately we're all the Supreme, but we've fallen into ignorance. So, how did we fall into ignorance? Prabhupada, he raises this point. He said, how, if we are God, how is it possible that we fell into ignorance? So that means that Maya must be greater than God. So that's how they get their philosophy, the Mayavada philosophy. Because Maya is greater than God. If, if they're all God and they've fallen into illusion, then Maya is greater than God. So they have this Mayavada philosophy, that Maya is the Supreme. So of course this is ridiculous, that Maya is the Supreme. It's never stated like that in the scriptures. But we want to conquer over Maya. What do we need to do? Hare Krishna. Surrender. Yeah, what, what's the verse? Sarva 
No, no, I wasn't thinking of that verse. What's that? Another verse? Chapter 7? Yes, right, yes. This material nature is duradhyaya, very difficult to overcome. But if we surrender to Krishna, it becomes very easy to go beyond it. Right? The, the material energy is under Krishna's control. And when we take shelter of Krishna, Krishna orders the material energy. Free this person. He's my devotee. Let him go. Just like sometimes the man comes with a big dog and the dog it won't let you go. It's getting... But the, the man's got his dog and the dog is under his control. He can... So we take shelter of the man and he saves us from the dog. So the material world is just like that. Being comes at us, it, it tra put, traps us. So we have to understand that how powerful the Lord is and that Maya is simply His energy. But these Vedavadarata people, they're saying, oh no, no, there's no God, we're all God, we're all God. We just have to come out of our ignorance. Then when we realize we're God, then we'll be free of all this illusion. So Maya is all powerful. Okay, is there any questions on this mantra? So, we heard the, in, this, in this mantra we heard about two kinds of miseducators, right? Remember? What are they? One kind, what's one kind of miseducator? Vedavadarata. Veda Vedavadarata. And another one was? Maya. So you can tell me about the Vedavadarata. What did they do? Okay, yeah. They do not follow any Acharya. No, they do follow Acharya. I mean, they do not follow the one of Right, they, don't, they have their own Acharyas, right? <laughs> hmm. All right, and the Maya Aparita Jnana? They are self-made gods. Somebody else. Let's hear a man. Tell me the Maya Aparita Jnana. Speculation. Speculation. They are philosophers, scientists, and uh, great poets and things like that. They just uh, their knowledge is fully utilized in development of their profession or development of their passion. They do not recognize God. They do not what? What did you say, Prabhu? They do not what? About God? They do not, they do not recognize God. They are more into uh, the passion of uh, developing their uh, uh, skills. Uh -huh. They don't go to temple. They don't worship the Lord. They may read the scriptures. But, but they don't know the Tarkas. Those whose intelligence is uh, stolen, Maharaj, like, means like they become demons and you know, lowest of the men. 
Why are they the lowest of the men? Uh, because when intelligence is stolen, actually, they, you know, uh, like for example, uh, uh, if, for example, if a person knows like something is wrong, for example, a cigarette packet, there is a written warning on that. You, I mean, it kills you, and still the person with the knowledge goes ahead and drinks. So you know, his knowledge, his intelligence is stolen, and that is where by knowing also. Uh, he is falling into the trap. So, you know, I don't know the example is right to explain, but then. Well, uh, I'm a bit lost to <laughs> tell you the truth. I don't know. Uh, but the example about written on the packet, the war warning, this is dangerous to help. So the warning is there, the person may not take the warning and he smokes anyway, yes. so that's his own fault. But, yes. but what, how does this apply in the case of these miseducators? The, they know about the Lord uh, and they know about uh, the characteristics of the uh, God, but then they don't follow them. They don't take uh, Lord seriously. Uh, they just go ahead with their own uh, like mind, whatever their mind says. Well, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if they do know about the Lord and His characteristics. I don't know about it. They may read the Vedas, but you know, the Vedas doesn't tell us very much about the Lord. You have to really know that you have to, you want to know about the Lord, you have to go to the, the, the the Puranas, you have to hear from the other side of it, because the Vedas deal more with the, the aspects of enjoying the material world and elevation to the higher planets. And that's why Krishna says from the Bhagavad Gita, Trigunya Vishaya Veda, nice Trigunya Bharvad, rise above the modes. The Vedas deal with the subject matter of the modes of nature. Rise above the modes, O Arjuna, and be transcendental to them. So just studying the Vedas itself, you're not going to know much about the nature of God or the Absolute. And, that, and this is why these so-called people, these, these Vedavadaratas or the Maya Aparita Jnana we're talking about, you know, they, they just try to philosophize, and they speak about, we may call them armchair philosophers. You know, they have these kind of philosophical societies, sit in a big armchair and people discuss about the Vedas. No, there's no mood of renunciation. They may sit there drink, drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes and they're discussing the Vedas. There's no detachment, there's no vairagya. And there's very little transcendental knowledge. It's a lot, it's, most of it is just their own speculations. They take words and they will give meanings to it, try to explain it all by the powers of their own mind. So this is the Maya Aparita Jnana. They don't hear the words of the bona fide acharyas coming through the disciplic succession. They want to show off their scholarship and their great learning, and they will give some obscure meanings to different slokas. And this way, the whole thing can be lost. I, I mean, you get people like this, you get things like people say, oh, it's okay, you can eat fish, the fish are the fruit of the sea. Right? So everybody can eat fish. So oh, people think, oh, very good. This is a good religion. You can eat fish. You, you don't have to be full vegetarian. Fish are like a fruit. You know, people have these kind of bogus philosophies. So we have to preach against these things. We have to expose the, the foolishness of these so-called people. And because of these miseducators, so many people go to hell. They're lost. 
because they thought they were hearing from some educated person. We, they thought these people are qualified, they're very educated, they're successful, they may be professors, they may be scholars, and so they've got recognition. So people think what they speak is the truth, but it can be totally nonsense. So this mantra of Ishopanishad is exposing them that they enter into the dark. Worse still are those engaged in the so-called culture of knowledge. The so-called culture of knowledge, more dangerous, most dangerous. Better people are just sense gratifiers. They're not so bad. But these so-called people, they're more dangerous. Okay, we have to stop here now. Thank you very much. If there's any questions, you can write them down and we'll hear them at the next class. Okay? Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Srila Prabhupada Maharaj Ki Jai. Jai. Gorbaita Vrinda Ki Jai. Jai. Haribo.